an allele is a different form of a gene. So the gene for eye color has alleles like blue, green, brown, hazel, etc., etc. So alleles are different forms of a gene. Gamete is a sex cell, somatic cell is a body cell. Bless you. The sex chromosomes are called are the X or Y chromosomes, and that determines the gender. So for females, XX, for males, XY, you should only have two sex chromosomes. Some of your cytogenetic reports may indicate otherwise, but that's an issue. So autosomal chromosomes are the other chromosomes. They're like your body chromosomes. So somatic, autosomal, those are the cells, those are the chromosomes that are not related to gender, not related to the sex of the individual. S-O-M-A-L. Um, we looked at FH1 briefly when we did our little example problem the other day, and it said that it was an autosomal dominant trait. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Sex-linked traits, they are traits, or it's inheritance of those characteristics that are linked to the sex chromosomes. It can either be the X or the Y, but for us, we're just going to look at X-linked traits. They're more common, and it's easier. So sex link traits are related to genes that are on the sex chromosomes. So for the alleles, for the forms of the gene, we can have a dominant allele, and a dominant allele is written with a capital letter, and that characteristic, that trait, that allele is always shown, it's always expressed if it's part of that person's DNA. So if you have a dominant allele, you will see that trait. Recessive alleles, they're written with a lowercase letter. That trait, that characteristic, that allele is only shown, it is only expressed if there is no dominant allele present.
this stuff sound familiar? Good. Okay. A genotype, those are the genes. They're represented by letters, two letters. Each gene, each characteristic, we're going to use two letters to represent. Do you know why we only use two letters and why we have to use two letters? Sort of, kind of. So you've got two letters that represent two of the same kind of gene. Where did we get each one of those same kind of genes from? One came from mom, one came from dad. So each genotype or each characteristic has its own two letters. But we can look at multiple genes. So we can look at hair color, eye color, and hairy knuckles. Hair color is going to have two letters. Um, eye color will have two letters. Hairy knuckles will have two letters. There might be six letters in all, but each set of two letters is indicating a different gene. Does that make sense? because we're going to look at more than monohybrid crosses. All right, phenotype. Phenotype are the traits, characteristics that are observed. Most of the time, people say that are seen, but that's not accurate. It's observed, because it could be what you see, but it could be what you smell, what you hear, what you taste, what you touch, anything like that. Whether an animal has rough or smooth fur, that's a phenotype. Whether something tastes sweet or salty, that's a phenotype. So phenotype are the traits or the characteristics that are observed. So hairy knuckles might have a genotype, capital H, lowercase h. Turns out that that's a dominant trait. So the phenotype, what you would observe is hair on the person's knuckles. Sound familiar? Yes? No? Okay. Oh, yeah. A couple more terms. Um, the example problem the other day talked about homozygous, heterozygous, homozygous, homogeneous. That means the same. Heterozygous, heterogeneous. That means different. So some examples, and hang on just a second. Hold on, hold on before you write something down. Let me explain this because I want your attention for just a second. So homozygous is the same. It doesn't matter if it's two dominant alleles or two recessive alleles, but they are the same alleles. When you are writing genotypes, you have got to make sure that me, the reader, whoever knows what you are writing. Some letters make that a little bit more difficult than others. So like lowercase p, I put lowercase letters. I tried to write them in cursive. Of course, if you all don't do cursive, then that doesn't necessarily work for you. So um, uppercase, lowercase, maybe a line so that I can see which is uppercase, lowercase. Um, some individuals like put a line through either the lowercase or the uppercase one to show that that was a lowercase or uppercase. So long as you're consistent and don't change and always put the line on the same one, then I'll be able to figure it out. The reader will be able to figure it out. But do you see how capital C and lowercase C, I don't, I, if you're writing fast, I'm never going to know. So you need to make sure that you indicate something that shows which one is a capital letter and which one's a lowercase letter when they aren't really obvious which is capital and which is lowercase. Heterozygous will always mean one of each. Hybrid um, is always going to have one of each. So heterozygous, hybrid are kind of two terms that mean the same thing. All right. So give yourself some examples of homozygous genotypes and heterozygous genotypes.
so when we determine probability, chances are you don't really even need this formula, but probability for a Punnett square, we've only got four possible outcomes on the monohybrid Punnett squares. Those are the only Punnett squares that I expect to like actually like draw out. If you may have done a dihybrid Punnett square before that has the 16 spaces on it, that's a pain and it's a waste of time. I'm going to show you how for dihybrid, trihybrid, octhybrid, dehybrid, whatever, that we can kind of um, cheat the system a little bit and there's a little trick that you can get probability because any individual has more than one characteristic. I mean, when you first start in on this, you look at yellow seeds and green seeds, monohybrid cross, okay, that's great, you do need to know how to do that. But that plant has more than just that, the, that one characteristic of seed color. So we're gonna look at things that are a little bit um, more intricate. Just in case, and you may or may not need this, just in case you need the formula for probability, it's the number of desired individuals, whatever you're looking for, divided by the total number of individuals times 100. So you do a Punnett square and one individual is homozygous dominant, that's what you're looking for, so it's one over four. But chances are you don't need that. I would bet that you already know that one over four is 25%, and two over four is 50%, and three over four is 75%, and four over four is 100%. And then just kind of make a note for yourself, laws of probability are going to apply here. We're gonna put that into our AP bio notebook because it is an AP bio thing, and we're gonna circle back around to that, but not today. For right now, we just need the simple stuff. What is what? INDV individual. I'm just gonna send you this video because we're just almost about done with what we're doing. One of the things that I did neglect that we do need to put on here that's part of PBS 222, but I don't even know if they specifically go into it in the lesson. So when you do your cytogenic reports, it may talk about a P arm and a Q arm. Does that sound familiar? P arm, Q arm? Oh, okay. Well. But we do need to make note. So on here, this is my chromosome that has two chromatids on it. When they say the P arm, the P arm is the shorter arm. It doesn't matter if it's on the top or on the bottom, there is no up and down within a cell. The shorter arm is the P arm. The longer arm is the Q arm. And this is the centromere where they're attached in the middle. P arm is the shorter arm, Q arm is the longer arm. I forgot to put that on there. All right, so hang on, pencils down. Let me just explain for just a second. Mm -hmm. P shorter, Q longer. Okay, so let's say that unibrow is a recessive trait. Recessive, lowercase letter. Recessive is only going to show if all I have is recessive characteristics. Um, no unibrow is the dominant trait. So we're gonna use a capital letter for this. Usually when they're determining what letters to use, they use something that's kind of related to the um, characteristic. Actually, the only reason why I use Bs on this is because it's very easy to see a capital B and a lowercase b. So we don't have to worry about the whole CC determining things, but you'll run across that. So this is an autosomal characteristic. This is a characteristic that's on one of the chromosomes that is not the sex chromosome, not the X or Y chromosome. So because it's autosomal, we are only concerned with those alleles for that trait itself. We don't have to worry about whether it's a boy or a girl that it's passing this stuff on. I have two parents. Doesn't matter which one's the mom and dad. If you feel the need to designate it, then go right ahead. We have two parents. We have two individuals that are mating. 
this means that this is being crossed with that. So this is a mating situation. This individual has no unibrow. Unibrow is a recessive trait. So having a capital and a lowercase, the dominant allele is going to take over. That's what we're going to see. This individual also has no unibrow. So can you imagine your parents, no unibrow, no unibrow in, my, in the family, and all of a sudden, bam, you end up with a unibrow, and you want to see where that comes from. All right. In this situation, we don't have that. But, but if I had two capital B, lowercase b's, then we would. This is just to show you how things um, are going to uh, sort out. One parent goes on one side of the Punnett square. One allele goes into each spot. The outside, there's only one letter in each spot that's available. One parent goes on one side, the other parent goes on the other side. Okay. When you fill in the Punnett square, everything that's on the left side goes into each box to the right. This goes into each box to the right. When I have, whenever I have a lowercase letter, I automatically put it on the far side because that you just that's how you write it. We don't write genotypes like this. That's not how you write it. You write it capital lowercase. So if I have a lowercase letter, I automatically put it where it's supposed to be. And I'll leave that space right there and write it in here. Everything on the top goes into each box below it. Everything on the top goes into each box below it. But notice, we're not crossing over. So this goes straight across where it's at. I don't put this down here. This goes straight across where it's at. I don't put that up there. These guys drop straight down below it. I don't cross it over here. So they each have their own specific place. Okay. So yes, no, you're probably familiar with these, right? Does that look familiar? Somewhat, maybe a little. All right. So I'm going to give you time to copy that, but I want to talk about the sex-linked trait real quick first before you pick up your pencils and stop listening to my melodious voice. If it's a sex-linked trait, so let's say this unibrow is, is sex-linked rather than on autosomal chromosome, it's on the X chromosome. It could be sex-linked and be either X or Y. Not now, because that's right in the middle of my turn. It could be on either the X or the Y, but we're going to focus on the sex-linked chromosomes that are X chromosomes because it's a little bit easier. So it's a sex-linked chromosome. It does matter whether it's a male or female. It does make a difference. The reason why it makes a difference is because the Y chromosome doesn't have this other leg of DNA. So sex-linked traits are going to have a locus right here that the Y chromosome does not have. So now we have two alleles, but now we only have one allele. So whatever allele the dad has, whatever allele the male has, that's the characteristic they're going to show. It doesn't matter what it is, I'm going to show no unibrow, I'm going to show unibrow, because I don't have another allele that could possibly dominate it and possibly uh, mute it out. So if it says it is a sex-linked characteristic, it matters, and you must put XXXY, you must have that on there. So they'll say mom has no unibrow, she's heterozygous. Heterozygous, capital B, lowercase b. Dad has no unibrow, has to be capital X, cap, it has to be X capital B. There's no other way around that. You're going to set up the Punnett square the same exact way. So I'm going to put one parent on one side. It doesn't matter where you put them so long as you put a parent on a side. This whole parent goes on its side. Don't put half here and half there. This whole parent goes on this side. This whole parent I put on this side right here. You fill it in the same way. So everything on this side goes into each box directly to the right. Everything on this side goes into each box directly to the right. Everything above goes into each box below it. Everything above goes into each box below it. No unibrow, capital B, capital B. No unibrow, capital B. That's what they're going to show. No unibrow, capital B, capital B. Bam. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, no unibrow parents. First three kids, no unibrow. Now little brother's got a unibrow. That's what they're going to show because they don't have another allele to dominate. Somatic cells or body cells, that's related to cell division but with mitosis because these give us identical cells. Gametes, sex cells, that's related to meiosis, that's related to our Punnett square stuff because that's the inheritance that we're looking at. Oops, I forgot this part right here. 
So when we're looking at probability, if you look at all the children in the whole, there's 25% chance of a child with a unibrow because we had one out of four. But when you're looking at the same situation, there is actually a 50% chance of a boy with a unibrow. Guys are much more likely to get sex-linked traits. Color blindness is much more common in guys. Um, hemophilia is a sex-linked trait much more common in guys. Much more common because they don't have another allele, they don't have another chromosome to um, have the chance to mute that, to dominate that characteristic. All right, how are we so far? Autosome, I'm okay, sex-linked. Thumbs down, thumbs up, somewhere in the middle. Do you understand the process, what's going on, what you have to do to determine our phenotypes? All right, so I'm going to give you a chance to copy things down. This is why I use the highlighter. If you are an expert on Punnett squares, then you don't necessarily need to do that. If this is your first time by some chance or if you need a big refresher, then you may want to use the color to show where that's going. Um, hold on just a second, guys. So 50% chance of a boy with a unibrow, with it. Um, unibrow is a uh, recessive characteristic. So the only way that shows is if I have two recessive alleles or only recessive alleles. So this person right here has a recessive allele, but they have the dominant one. So dominant is no unibrow, so that's what shows. Two dominant unibrow, or no unibrow. One dominant, no unibrow. Has only recessive alleles, so this is the only individual that will have um, the unibrow trait. So there's only a one in four chance, a one in four chance, which is 25% of any child in this situation having a unibrow. But the truth is, is that there's a 0% chance of a girl ever having a unibrow with these two parents. They will never, because they'll always get a dominant allele from their dad. They will always. So even if mom gives them one, even if mom has a unibrow and dad doesn't, there's still a 0% chance. Because even if this is a lowercase b, they'll still both be heterozygous, but they'll both have a dominant allele. So there's a 0% chance of those girls ever having a unibrow in this situation. 50% chance of a boy having it because dad is only going to be able to give the Y chromosome for it to be a boy. So does that boy happen to get this one from mom? Does it happen to get this one from mom? There's a 50-50 shot all the time. This is PBS stuff. 